being here this morning. I'm finding myself trapped. I'm going to start off by asking a simple question. Uh, and I'm really speaking about when you're online. So when you're online, is this true? Raise your hand if you think it's true. Everything you see online, you can believe. OK. Raise your hand if you think uh, you should question what you see online. OK, that's good. So let's dig in. So I think today we're at this unique time where there's this kind of collision of technology. And when I say technology, I mean how we all have these. We all have smartphones in our pockets. So we're all taking pictures and taking video all the time. In tandem with that are new ways to actually edit those pictures and those videos, right? We all have ways that we can edit them to make, sometimes make ourselves look better, but also sometimes to misinform. I think another thing that we deal with is distribution. I think we all agree that today there are social platforms, there are chat apps that make the speed of information so much faster than it used to be. And then the third component is that audience. It's everyone out here. I think we are now today in this unique environment where we all like to share a video we see or a photo we see. And I think that makes it a very unique time uh, where I'm going to talk about how I think misinformation can be combated. So let's talk a little bit about photos. This grid shows pictures that have been mostly unintentionally published by news organizations over the last decade, let's say. Some of these pictures were actually manipulated in the field. Some of these pictures were actually handed out by governments. And some of these pictures were actually taken by people with cell phones, user-generated content. But the problem with every single picture on this grid is that it's been manipulated. Here are just some examples of how that's been done. Let's talk about another example. Uh, so this is what happened a couple years back the downing of Malaysian Airlines 17. So many of you probably remember this happened in the Ukraine. But what was very interesting about it was the Ukraine has feature phones, it has smartphones, and it has internet. So unique to many plane crashes, we started seeing photographs come through very shortly after the first reports of the plane going down. What you see up here, we see some pictures, like the one on the left, that actually turned out to be real. That's a real photograph of somebody standing on parts of the fuselage. But we also saw things like on the right, which I'm going to show you is actually a picture that was not real. This picture, look, as you see up here, seemed to be wreckage of the airplane with Malaysian Airlines logo on the side. However, by using simple tools like reverse image search, which is a technology, a free technology uh, provided by these three outlets and some others, that allows you to actually search for an image to see if it's been online before. And if it has, when and where. And what that allows you to do with some of these questionable images is to get an idea of, is this a picture, something that happened today? Or is it something that has been seen before? And if it's been seen before, it's probably not from today. So at this breaking news instance, you could have reversed image searched that photograph and noted that it's actually from a TV show from America called Lost. And so what somebody did during that breaking news instance is they took that picture, they photoshopped it in Malaysian Airlines, and then put it out on Twitter where over 3,000 people were retweeting it in the first hours of that plane disaster. This is used to re-emphasize kind of the media environment that we all live in today, that no longer can you necessarily believe every picture that you see? My hope today is to give everyone in this audience some tools to allow you to help better verify the content that you see so you don't unintentionally pass along more misinformation and amplify the issue. Reverse image search. Here's another example of it, though. This was actually a fairly recent story that the New York Times and, and USA did about uh, what they called the migrant caravan that was occurring, where people were emigrating up from um, through Mexico and into the United States. There was a lot of information going on social media about support and not support for this, uh, this caravan. What the New York Times did is they actually looked at some of the popular posts, and they did reverse image searches. And they found out that posts that were saying they were from today were actually from events that happened years ago. So in that instance, the pictures were real but they were being misrepresented as something that was happening now. 
so they weren't being manipulated like that photoshopping of the airliner, but they were being misattributed just to an event that was happening in current times. Here is another great example of how these photo manipulations are happening today. Does anyone recognize this picture? This is a famous photo from the late 90s of uh, Rwandan Hutus that actually was just being used this last December by the Myanmar army. What the Myanmar army did is they published a book that supported their side of events and they used this photo in black and white to actually attribute it to people who were actually entering Myanmar. When in truth, this was a picture from the late 90s that was being repurposed. Technology like reverse image search would allow you to find that this picture was something that was actually taken years before and help debunk that. Because of this, Reuters reported that the Army apologized for publishing this book with that fake imagery. And even something very, very recently, so this is something that happened this month. Um, there was actually an event where a bunch of tech entrepreneurs got together in an Italian village, and GQ did an article about this. The problem with this picture is that two of the attendees that were female were not available when the picture was taken. So what happened was the organizers decided to Photoshop the people in. And it was people uh, online who recognized that the two women were actually photoshopped into the original photo. One of the ways they found this out was somebody had placed that original photo already online. And so again, reverse image search could have been useful to locate the original photo and realize that the one that, that was published was manipulated. So again, today in the time we have, I want to make sure everyone understands what reverse image search does. It allows you to take an image and, and see across the indexed internet if it's been seen before. It's going to tell you if it has been seen before, when, and where. And so it's very good for debunking images, meaning to debunk that it's not from today or it's not from that event, but it does not in itself verify. Okay, so it's really good for seeing if a picture's been posted before, but it won't necessarily tell you if something is necessarily true and from today. Moving forward, let's talk a little bit about video. So nowadays, more and more, we're actually seeing videos being captured, and we're seeing videos that come up. In this example, there was a video that was shot that showed uh, a killing of women and children that looked to be somewhere in Africa. And if this video actually came out years ago, it probably might have been something that went unsolved. But in this example that I love to highlight, this is the BBC News that utilized free software available to everyone here today that allowed them to identify by looking at the video and using a technology that allows you to look at satellite imagery where that killing occurred. I'm going to show just a little bit of this video so you get the idea, but I want to show you exactly how they kind of walked through and did this. So they had some video that showed some topography, it showed some terrain, and they used that 3D software to actually find that same mountain ridge, which then gave them an idea of where this occurred. Um, there's a great Twitter thread that talked a little bit of steps they took in doing this, but I want to make sure that we highlight today that this was done using a program called Google Earth Pro on desktop. This software is completely free to everybody. You can download it today to your computer, and it's going to allow you to see satellite imagery from most places on Earth, including things like terrain and 3D maps. It'll show you things like this, the building we're in today, right? You can actually walk back in time and see what this building looked like years before. It'll also show you things like this. This is a 2004 image of the airport. I can walk through time and see how from 2004 to 2010, looks like the runway was elongated. It also looks like the, the town that was underneath the airport there, south of the airport, grew. And I can then jump forward to 2018 and notice how much growth has occurred in that amount of time. So let me show you a little bit of this video that gives you an idea of how this software works, and then we'll jump into the next topic. These women and children are being led to their deaths. The soldiers accuse them of belonging to the jihadist group Boko Haram. In the final scene of this video, too graphic to show here, they are blindfolded, forced to the ground, and shot at close range 22 times. One of the women still has the baby strapped to her back. The video began to circulate on July 10, 2018. 
Some claimed that this atrocity took place in Mali. But others said it was filmed in the far north of Cameroon, where government soldiers have been fighting Boko Haram since 2014. The government of Cameroon initially dismissed the video as fake news. A month later, they announced that seven members of the military were under investigation. But there has still been no official admission that these killings were carried out on Cameroonian soil by government soldiers, and there is still no guarantee that anyone will be held to account. So how can we tell what really happened here? Over the next few minutes, we're going to follow these women and children on the short walk to the end of their lives and to glean from this video the clues that tell us where this happened, when it happened, and who is responsible for this atrocity. This looks like the kind of dusty, anonymous track that could be anywhere in the Sahel. But the first 40 seconds of the film capture a mountain range with a distinctive profile. We spent hours trying to match this range to the topography of northern Cameroon. And then, in late July, we received a tip-off from a Cameroonian source. Have you looked at the area near Zelevet? Close to the town of Zelevet, we found a match for the ridgeline. It places the scene on a dirt road just outside a village called Krawamafa. A few hundred meters away is the border with Nigeria. The video also reveals other details that can be matched precisely to what we see on the satellite imagery. This track, these buildings, and these trees. Putting all this evidence together, we can say with certainty that the killings took place here. Less than a kilometre away, in Zelevet, we found this compound and identified it as a combat outpost used by the Cameroonian military in their fight against Boko Haram. We'll come back to this base later. Exactly when the killings took place is, at first sight, harder to say. But again, the video contains clues. This building is visible on satellite imagery, but only until February 2016. The murders must have happened before that date. Satellite images also capture this structure. The walls surrounding it are present in imagery dated March 2015, but had not yet been built in November 2014, giving us an earliest possible date for the atrocity. The video also reveals this footpath, a path that only appears in the hot, dry season between January and April. There are other, less obvious clues in the video. Okay, so I don't want to show all of that, but I encourage everyone, if they were very interested in what happened there, to watch the rest of the video. The video is about 12 minutes long, and it actually, I, I, I love that it blends the idea of current technology with reporting to help push forward this story. Um, and so again, I encourage all of you to watch it. I want to remind you that everything they did in that program can be done from London. You know, they had a tip off that gave them a little bit of an idea of the location in Africa, but the technology that's around today allows these kinds of investigations to be done from almost anywhere in the world. So to recap, Google Earth Pro, free to use, you can all download it today. It shows you recent and historical satellite imagery, so you can see how things have changed. It can be used for verification, but it could also be used for general storytelling to show how a city's changed or how a village or neighborhood has changed. Um, and in certain locations, you're going to see that terrain and that 3D mapping as well. Um, let's talk about the last subject that I want to talk about today, which is synthetic media. Many of you may have heard of this before. It's something that is becoming more and more covered in the media, also known as something called deep fakes. Uh, now, what deep fakes are 
It's basically a way to use AI synthesized um, compu well, computers to AI synthesize a fake. Many times it's video. It can also be done with audio. But what it, what it opens up is the door to make somebody who hasn't done something appear to have done that, whether it be talking, whether it be speaking something. Uh, and so that's one issue. The other issue that I see is that as this technology becomes easier and easier to use, people can actually have plausible deniability, meaning to say they can say, oh, that wasn't me. That was a deep fake. You know, I didn't actually do it even though I was caught on video. Let me give you an idea of what these things look like. Here is a great example of one fairly recently. What you're seeing on the left hand of the screen is an actual video of the actor from Bohemian Rhapsody accepting his award. What you're looking at on the right side of the screen is a facial overlay of the actor Nicolas Cage um, with the same intonation and body structure. So all that's been changed is the face. And so this is done by modeling photographs of Nicolas Cage and overlaying them. This is what it looks like here. Well, I just want to say thank you guys for being here. And I will say this. I, I don't think uh, critically this, the, the, the decision on this film was unanimous, but I, I do appreciate everything you guys had to write as a kid. Uh, I so hopefully that gives you an idea. Obviously that example is entertainment based, you know, but it gives you an idea of where the technology is at. I think uh, the part that concerns me is not necessarily people doing that, not people swapping a Nicolas Cage onto somebody else's face. It's examples like this, which is an older example, so the technology isn't quite as good. But this was something that BuzzFeed did to raise awareness of this subject uh, a little while back. I'm gonna show just part of this video. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, I don't know, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would, someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up. So this is an example of what's possible out there. Uh, and today, uh, there's a lot of research being done on how these detection capabilities uh, can hopefully find these. So again, not to really uh, pick up the entertainment examples, but to pick up examples like we just saw uh, that can happen to anybody. Uh, I wanted to show one more example that just happened, what, four days ago. Um, and this was in relation to uh, a video uh, of, a, of a governmental leader in the United States um, that was slowed down to make it appear like she was stammering or maybe drunk. Uh, and then uh, uh, somebody in, re in response to that actually made a video of Mark Zuckerberg. So what you're watching here is a, is a deep fake of Mark Zuckerberg saying things that he did not say uh, in relation to response to that Pelosi event. Imagine this for a second. One man with total control of billions of people's stolen data, all their secrets, their lives, their futures. I owe it all to Spectre. Spectre showed me that whoever controls the data controls the future. So again, an example, this is not real. This is, uh, Spectre is a throwback to James Bond film. Uh, but the idea being that uh, synthetic media is at a place now where almost off-the-shelf technology can allow you to build these, uh, these, these deep fakes or these synthetic videos. Um, there is a very growing concern that uh, if especially in my country, the, the upcoming elections in 2020, we'll see more and more of these, potentially having people who are running for elected office saying or doing things that maybe they didn't do. Um, here are some important projects, I think, that are looking at this space. Again, the detection technology is getting better and better, but the deep fakes in tandem are also getting better and better. 
Um, some of these are companies up here that have private solutions. Some of these are research institutions that are actually looking at detection capabilities. And there's also some uh, military projects in there that are looking at this concerning national security. This URL, tinyurl.com slash deepfakegv for go viral, uh, is where if you're interested in learning more about this, this will take you to a uh, Google Scholar page that has some of the most up-to-date uh, open information about uh, where this technology is at. But I really wanted to throw that out here today that uh, it's something that I think we're, we'll be seeing more and more of. Hopefully, uh, as detection capabilities become more prevalent, um, it won't be something that uh, has a huge impact into politics or global relations. Um, so again, I want to pose this question to you. Is seeing believing, right? A lot of people ask me what the solution is, and I don't have the solution. But here are some tips that I think we should all think about going forward. I like to tell people tools, training, and time is the way to attack the problem. Tools being the idea that working with platforms, working with uh, ad networks, building verification tools that can potentially combat these problems, and collaborating, what you're doing here today, meeting other people who have shared interests, and hopefully some people out in this audience will help make a dent in this problem. Training, again, exactly what we're here doing today, taking the time to think through how can we react to this when we see them, but also sometimes how can we be proactive to make sure that the workflows we follow incorporate time to do verification. Counter-narrative, the idea of how much do we debunk the fakes or how much time do we spend actually making original engaging content? What is that ratio? And the last thing is time. There is no quick fix. I think it's going to be a mix of the tools, the media literacy, meaning the audience, everyone out there. How do we make sure that we're questioning, is this real? Could this be fake? Where did this come from? Uh, do I trust the person who posted it? The idea of research, the people out there who are on the front ends of this trying to figure out what solutions are, and the idea of trust, where we can go back to a place where hopefully we can answer a, a, a better and more fruitful answer to that is seeing, believing. With that, I thank you for your time. Please feel free to connect with me, send me an email. I'll be here today and tomorrow. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Did you want to do Q&A? OK. And so with that, I'm happy to answer quick questions for Q&A. OK, let me do two. Anyone have a question? Anything? Yeah. Microphone. Uh, so there are tools. Uh, so a couple things. One thing I'll talk about, there's a company called TruePick, which is what they're trying to do is they're actually trying to do what they call chain of custody, meaning that if when somebody makes an original asset, they're trying to write it to the blockchain. So if it ever is altered moving forward, we know where the original was, right? And so that's one way to do it. The challenges with that is actually getting people to use that technology at the beginning, at the creation. I know of another project happening where people are actually modeling the intonations of known uh, people. So let's say, let's, my president, right, President Trump. They'll model how his facial movements work. And that way, if a deep fake comes up of him, if it doesn't match the known model, it could be you know, a flag that this might be something fake, right? But I would point you back to some of that research. There is no simplistic tool. You know, uh, obviously, because synthetic media is something new, we don't have the developed tools that we have for photos and videos yet today. But I think um, people are concerned. So I think there will be uh, a lot more coming forth in the next months, next years. Great question. One more question. Yes, please. Thank you for your lecture. Um, I have a question. Can you speak up just a little bit? Does it work? OK. okay. So we had a similar situation with Cameroon. Uh, we recently had elections, and there were lots of videos in which we saw some falsifications of the votes and um, pens with disappearing ink, uh, which uh, election committee officially t said that it's fake news. And I was just wondering what would you do, um, what would be your first steps to verify such videos and say that it's not fake? Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, you're saying that you had videos out of Cameroon showing people potentially voting with things in maybe fake inks and things like that? There were inks with which, uh, w in which the link disappeared if you put on f uh, fire, like uh, the heating next to the paper in okay. which this link is. And there were also videos in which people come to the voting boxes and put a lot of ballots, like more than one. 
for a certain candidate yeah. and there were lots of videos like that circulating on social media but it was hard to verify yeah. uh, where who is the author and um, if we can um, get an evidence that it's true. Yeah, so in that instance, so first off, very specific challenge. Uh, what I would say though, just from what you've told me, is a lot of the times it's very helpful if you can find the originals, right? The original video, meaning obviously you'd need somebody on the ground to see if you can source out, not the version that's on social media because that could be moved all around and it has a lesser uh, quality to it, but trying to locate the originals. Uh, and if you have the originals, two things you look at. You can look at the technical file, meaning uh, you know any metadata that's potentially still in that technical file, or you can look at what's in the visual, kind of like what they did with the BBC, and see if you can then locate potentially where this uh, is happening and seeing if you could then probably use journalistic techniques to talk to people who may have been around on that day in that location. But what you're talking about is a challenge. I'm very happy to talk to you after the fact if they can you know, dig more into that. But again, very specified. But these are exactly highlighting the challenges that people are running into today. So well, with that, I want to be cognizant of time. Thank you all for attending. Uh, I look forward to talking to many of you if you have additional questions, but I'm very, very happy that people showed up to learn more about this because, again, I think this is going to be a big challenge moving forward. So with that, thank you so much.